Sandy, what difference would a juryless trial make to victims of, of um, sexual crimes? So that, this was a proposal originally made by Lady Doreen, the second most senior judge in Scotland, and it, it was against the backdrop of significant international evidence suggesting that rape myths, the false assumptions about rape, could be having an impact in jury deliberations in rape cases. So I, I think it's really about testing a different approach to see if we can look at ensuring confidence in jury decision making that is based in the evidence evidence not in false assumptions or false beliefs about rape or about women's sexuality. Uh, Tony, you, you've said that this you can't think of anything that's caused greater disquiet within the legal profession. Why so? There's a widely held fear that this would be a move designed to engineer higher conviction rates. The system at the moment where 15 members of the public without age restrictions or occupation disclosures or anything like that come together to bring their life experience to bear is a system in which I have confidence. If we move to a system where that is taken away, there's a negative attached to the loss of the democratic function of a jury, but also it is the fear that with the appointment process or with the controls on who sits on this and the pressure to deliver convictions, that we move away from a system which has justice at its centre to something which has conviction rates at its centre. So I wouldn't have confidence in that new system. Would you accept, though, that conviction rates for um, sex um, cases are lower than for other crimes? It can't be looked at as simply as that. There are really two categories. Where you have cases which involve single event, single complainer, then the conviction rates, I'm certain, are lower for that than anything else. But the reason for that in my experience and the experience of my association is that the evidence available to a jury in cases like that, single event cases, routinely is not sufficient to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt. Juries in my experience have no difficulty convicting people where with modern police methods they track back through previous partners and you then have an array to show that the life of the person on trial has always included this sinister element. Juries have no difficulty convicting in those situations. So I don't perceive from my experience of this that it's a question of jury bias. It seems to me that it's, it's determined by the evidence available and nothing else. Uh, Sandy, um, you say your concerns are that uh, juries are making decisions based not on the evidence but on false assumptions. What's your evidence for that? Well, the, the, there's been significant research internationally and in Scotland that have, have found the impact of rape myths could be significant in jury decision making. So we had mock jury research in Scotland, but there's also been research in New Zealand where they spoke to people who sat in rape juries and what they found was that false assumptions were definitely present. So, so things like assuming that if somebody had really been raped, they would report straight away, they'd behave in a certain way, their demeanour would be um, behave in a certain way. And what we know is that the impact of trauma can be counterintuitive to how members of the public might perceive that. And I, I, I think it's not about an arbitrary uh, target of convictions, it's about a confidence that the right decision has been made. I mean, I, I think me and Tony both want the same thing, which is guilty men to be convicted and innocent men not to be. And I, I think our, our difference really is about the best way to achieve that. So if, if you... Um acknowledge that up to a point there are fewer convictions for, for, for sex crimes and, and you, you did qualify that but um, what, what would be the alternative then how, how do you deal with it? Well, the interesting thing is at the tail end of last year we brought in new chapters of jury directions to explain to the jury that preconceived ideas about a, a delay in reporting, preconceived ideas about not offering violence, um, about a more complicated journey towards reporting in fact should be taken to mean either nothing or very little. No assumption should be made from that because experience has taught us and the jury are told this by the judges both at the start in the written directions and in the judges charge at the end before they go to take the decision put these things out of your mind this is what experience has told has that us. Has made any difference though? I think it has and my, the, the, the members of my association our association represents the greatest body of trial experience of serious criminal allegations in Scotland. And the view of our association is that these are hard-hitting directions. At the very least, there should be some sort of research carried out to see the difference that these make. Are I you have not to accepting that, Sandy? 
I, I, I think the new judicial directions are important. I, I, I suppose fundamentally I don't share Tony's confidence with juries as they're working currently. I mean, we, we've been contacted by a number of people who sat and raped juries to say, I just wanted to tell somebody how horrified I was at the attitudes that were being expressed during those deliberations. The Scottish Government released statistics last week showing that the conviction rate in single complainer cases, the cases that Tony's talking about in this pilot we'd be dealing with, is around 24% of cases that get to court compared to an average of about 90 for, for all crime types. I think there is a real problem with women routinely being failed by a justice system in these circumstances. And what would you say to that, Tony? I don't think it's a failure of the justice system. I think it's the reality of the evidence available in that sort of situation. Because it's all very Can well... Can it be arguable then, though, that, that juries might not see it, but if you have legal specialists in these trials, that they will see the evidence, perhaps better than a jury, for want of a better word, better than the jury might? I don't think so at all. I don't think so at all. The, the practical reality is that the body of research referred to includes the Scottish Mock Trial Project, which wasn't designed to deal with exactly what we're dealing with here. And it overlooks the fact that south of the border, there was an enormous study carried out with real jurors, not people pretending to sit in a jury, which didn't reach this conclusion and does not support what's being suggested. So my difficulty is that if you're going to take a step away from democracy, you need to be very sure of your ground. Otherwise, it is not something which will inspire public confidence. And you need to keep co public confidence in the system of administration of criminal justice. Is it not a concern, Sandy, that this is a pilot case, so that actually people who are accused in these pilot cases are essentially guinea pigs? I think this, this was proposed by the second most senior judge in Scotland. If, if there was an issue with its compatibility with human rights, I don't think it would be before the Scottish Parliament just now. But if uh, it doesn't if, work, if the, pilots, if the pilot is, doesn't succeed and for whatever reason it's scrapped, the people who were convicted during that pilot are guinea pigs, aren't they? I, mean, I, I suppose it depends what you mean by succeed. I, I think one of the, the key benefits to complainers anyway of the judge-led pilot is being given written explanations for the decision because it, at the moment rape survivors, if there is an acquittal, are left with nothing, like left with no way of understanding what's happened. And I, I have seen cases where there's been significant evidence, including evidence of physical injury, and the jury has acquitted, and it, it, it seems quite inexplicable to, 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 to me. So I, I don't think it is only about the limits of evidence in these cases. I think at times it is about jury interpretation of the evidence and understanding of key legal concepts, for example, what beyond reasonable doubt means. I don't see a problem with juries. I don't see juries who take outlandish decisions in cases. Even when juries don't do what I ask them to do, that happens not infrequently, I can understand why they've done what they've done. And it gives me confidence. I wouldn't have confidence in the new system. Very finally, the, the legal profession is notoriously resistant to change, though, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know if I can agree it's notoriously resistant to change. There is a resistance generally to changing things which have been seen to work, but I don't think that's reactionary. Um, my approach to it is not founded in any particular investment in the fact that we've been doing it for a long time. It's in the fact that I've been observing this from the inside for decades and I see a system that works and has public confidence. And Sandy, the, any pilot, we're talking about 2028, that's some considerable time away. It is a considerable time away and I, I think in the meantime it is really important to reflect on the changes that have come in, for example the judicial directions that Tony has spoken about but also the other measures in the bill. There, there are a lot of really other important measures in this bill that we need to be considering. I, I thought it was quite disappointing to see in Parliament today the amount of um, MSPs who abstained on the bill. Like rape survivors and sexual offence survivors have fought so hard for these changes to try and make things better for women coming out after them and I, I really, really hope that the Scottish Parliament listens to survivors' voices about the need for change overall across the system to, to reduce the re-trauma that people are experiencing when they seek justice in Scotland after rape. Sandy, Tony, thanks for joining us in this call tonight.